A Terrible Vengeance Chapter 3 By noon the next day, everyone in Shepperton and Lower Halliford knew Lucy Heath was missing. Her mother had been up to Tooney, but Lucy was not with her aunt, who lived not very far from the bridge on the Fulham side, and who, having made a fruit married a fruitier, and worked up a very good business, was inclined to take such bustling and practical views of life and its concerns as rather dismayed her sister-in-law, who had spent so many years in the remote country, and then so many years in quiet Shepperton, that Miss Pointer's talk flurred her almost as much as the noises of London, which often maddens middle-aged and elderly folk happily unaccustomed to its roar. Girt about was a checkered apron which lovingly enfolded a goodly portion of her comfortable figure, Miss Pointer received her early visitor with the support of remark. "'Why, it's never Martha Heath. Come along in. A sight for you is good for sore eyes.' But Miss Heath repelled all such humorous observations, and chilled those suggestions of hospitality the pointers were never backward at making, by asking in a low, choked voice, "'Is Lucy here?' "'Loy, what put such a funny lotion in your head?' "'Ah, I see she is trying to smile.' "'After all, she must have spent the night with you.' "'Did what?' exclaimed Miss Pointer. "'Spend the night? Was that what you said?' "'No, nor the day either, for this year nearly. "'Why, for the last four months she hasn't set foot across the doorstep, "'unless it might be to buy some cherries, pears, or apples, "'or maybe some grapes and such like. "'And then she came in with more air than any lady, "'and after paying her money and getting her goods went out again, just as if I hadn't been her father's sister and pointer my husband. Oh, but there, for any sake, woman, don't look like that. Come in the parlour and tell me what's wrong. You never mean she's gone away and left you. Poor Miss Heath was perfectly incapable at the moment of saying what she did mean. Sitting on a stool and, hold down fat, and holding fast by the edge of the counter, for fear of falling, the shop and its contents, the early buses, the people along the pavement, the tradesmen's carts, the private carriages, were, as in some terrible nightmare, gyrating before her eyes. She could not speak, and she could scarcely think, until that wild whirligig came to a stand. For a moment or two, even Miss Pointer seemed multiplied by fifty, while the checkered apron and the bananas suspended from the hooks, and the baskets of fruit, the pineapples, the melons, the tomatoes, and the cobnuts appeared and disappeared only to reappear and disappear like the riders in a maddening guinea-go-round. Give, give me a drop of water, she said at last, and when the water was brought she drank a little and poured some on her handkerchief, dabbing her face, and finally suffered herself to be escorted into the parlor, where she told her tale interrupted by many sobs. It would have been unchristian in Miss Pointer to exult, but it was only human to remember she had remarked to Pointer in that terrible spirit of prophecy bestowed for some inscrutable reason on dear friends and close relations, she knew from such trouble must befall her sister-in-law. "'You made an idol of that girl, Martha,' she went on, "'and now it's coming home to you. I'm sure it was last August as ever was that Pointer, oh, but here he is, and he'll talk to you himself.' Which Mr. Pointer did, being very fond of the sound of his own foolish voice. He started how bad a thing it was for people to be above their station, or to bring children up above the rank of life in which it had pleased God to place them. He quoted many pleasing saws uttered by his father and grandfather, remarked that his folks sowed that they were bound to reap, reminded Mrs. Heath that they had the word of Scripture for the fact, then, which parenthetically no fact could be truer as he knew, that a man might not gather grapes from thorns, or even figs from thistles. Further, he went on to observe generally the observation, having a particular reference to Lucy, that it did not do to judge things by their looks. Over and, over and over again, salesmen had tried to shove off a lot of forward fruit on him, but he wasn't a young bird to be taken in by that chaff. No, what he looked to was quality. It was what his customers expected from him, and what he could honestly declare his customers got. He was a plain man, and he thought honestly was the best policy. So as Miss Heath had seen fit to come to them in her trouble, he would tell her what he thought, without beating about the bush, and believe Lucy had simply gone off. B but where? asked Miss Poor Heath. That I'm not wise enough to say, but you'll find she's gone off, 
Girls on her station don't sport chains and bracelets and brooches for nothing. But they did not cost many shillings, interposed the mother. Oh, she might tell you that, observed Miss Pointer with a word of meaning. To say nothing, went on Mr. Pointer, of grey gloves she could not bear to be touched. One day she walked in when I was buying the counter, and not knowing she'd been raised to the peerage, I shook hands with her as a matter of course. But when I saw the young lady look at her glove as if I had dirtied it, I said, Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Jokerly, you know. They soil so easily, she lisped. I haven't patience with such ways, interloped Miss Pointer without any lisp at all. Yes, it's hard for you, Martha, but you may depend Porter's right. Indeed, I expect how it would be long ago. Young women who are walking in the straight road don't dress as Lucy dress, or dare their innocent little cousins to call them by their Christian names in the street. Since the spring and long before, Pointer and me had been sure Lucy was up to no good. Well, and you held your tongues and never said a word to me? retorted Miss Heath, goaded and driven to desperation. Much use it would have been to say in anything to you, answered Miss Pointer. When you told me about young gently, and I bid you be careful, how did you take my advice? Why, you blurred out at me, went on as if I knew nothing and had never been anywhere. What I told you then, though, I tell you now. Young Grantley's the son of rectors and the grandson of colonels. Don't come after farmer's daughters with any honest purpose. But yet young Grantley asked her last evening to, to fix a day for their marriage, said Miss Heath, little triumph. Oh, I dare say, scoffed Miss Pointer. Chalk is, talk is quite cheap, observed Miss Pointer. Some folks have more of it than money, supplemented his wife. They have been, as I understand it, keeping company for some time now, said the fruitier whether he had deemed telling a judicial calmness. So if he asked her the, to name the day, why did she not name it? Uh, I, I don't know. I've not seen her since. Oh, then you'd only his word about the matter, summed up Miss Pointer. Just as I thought, just as I thought. Oh, what do you think? inquired the poor troubled mother. Why, that she's gone off with Mr. Grantley. Oh, you don't know Mr. Grantley, or you wouldn't say such a thing. Oh, that is true, observed Mr. Pointer, but I do not know the gentleman, and I may add, I do not want to know him. But speaking as a person acquainted with the world, I'll be getting home, interrupted Miss Heath. Most likely my girls, though, they're waiting for me, and a fine laugh she'll have against her poor old mother for being in such a talking. Uh, yes, Lucy will have breakfast ready. Uh, no, no, thank you. I'll not wait to take anything. Uh, there'll be a train back quite presently, and besides, to tell you the truth, Food would choke me till I sit down again with my girl, and then I won't be able to eat for joy. Husband and wife looked at each other as Miss Heath spoke, and for the moment a deep pity pierced the hard crust of their worldly egotism. Wait a green minute, cried Miss Pointer. I'll put on my bonnet go with you. No, interrupted Miss Pointer, instantly seizing his wife's idea and appropriating it for his own. I am the proper person to see this affair out. There's not much doing, and if there were, I would leave everything to obtain justice for your niece. After all, however wrong she may have gone, well, she is your niece, Mary. And which exceedingly nasty remark, which held a world volume of unpleasant meaning, as to what Mr. Pointer might expect from that relationship in the future, Mr. Pointer took Miss Heath by the arm and piloted her slowly out into the street, and finally to Lower Halliford, where the missing Lucy was not, and no tidings of her had come.